it's always something. Our clock back there says 6.20. So. Are you ready to hear Debbie Stewart tonight? You are loved. Yes. Steve Smith says one of his, um, the best things he's ever done in ministry is he hired Debbie Stewart at Preston Wood to be the women's minister. <laughs> And I got to say, I, I was part of the leadership, and we were floundering a bit. And so some of the girls, like after they he interviewed with you, they opened the door and said, don't mess this up. <laughs> and then you got to work again with Steve at the Hope Center. June Hunt's here, and so you guys are, have a great relationship, too, and with Steve at the Hope Center. I'm just so happy that you're here. I told um, our church this Sunday that it's going to smell like heaven in here, like you're at a, um, at a place that you go, perfumery, <laughs> because it's going to be the sweet, sweet spirit of the Lord, the aroma, the beautifulness of God that we're going to worship today. We are going to sing, and i got to touch a laryngitis, i got to tell you, and I don't know if you're not singing. So we're going we're gonna to sing together, sing out, make a joyful noise. And Debbie, we're just so grateful that you're here. And so after we sing, come. Presumptuous to say that this is a magnificent Monday, 
but it's based on the scripture, Psalm 145, that says God is magnificent. He has never been praised enough. So stand and let's say that together. God is magnificent. He can never be praised enough. There are no boundaries to his grace. Generation after generation stands in awe of your work. Each one tells of your mighty acts, your beauty and splendor, have everyone talking. I compose songs on your wonders. What a friend we have in Jesus. cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old flexibility, right? <laughs> All right, we're singing. Now this one too. Amanda's going to lead us. God sent his son. They called him
song. You can stand or sit if you want to. I really mean it on this one. You ready, Jazz? Sure. She's going to lead us.
Father God, please, please use Debbie Stewart and uh, speak through her to us today uh, about the great comforter and uh, about your Holy Spirit, Father. Have us be enlightened and um, have us receive what you want to say directly to us. We thank you for her love for you. We thank you for this, this room, this sweet aroma to you, Father. We lift our lives up to you just now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to get this. Um, thank you. Get this uh, podium up here, and I'll get my notes out. My goodness, it is such a great thing to see you and to see a lot of my people. I want you to know I appreciate you being here, coming out on a hot uh, August night on a, I don't know, 150 degrees outside, whatever it is these days. <laughs> This encouragement to me, and this church means a great deal to me, as does Steve Smith and Donna. Uh, Steve Smith took a chance on a country girl that loved women's ministry some years ago, and this church licensed me to the gospel ministry, and so it has a, such a great uh, personal place in my life. Um, listen, the Lord has sent me with an unusual message for you tonight. I had sent Donna a handout a couple of weeks back of what we were going to discuss and go over. And about two days ago, I told her to throw that away. The Lord has gone in a completely different direction, as he often does from time to time. So let me just update you a little bit on family. So many of you have asked. Thank you for doing that. And I'm going to take this earring off. I can hear it clicking. So many of you have asked about family and Jared and John Mark, and so much has happened since I've been here last. Uh, some of you may know that my husband, John Mark, now we call him the two disciples because we know it takes two disciples to keep me in line, John and Mark, and uh, his full-time job, but he had a heart transplant in January of 2020. Following that, just six weeks later, our son was released from 10 and a half years of prison. So on March the 5th, he was released, and, and you know what was happening in March of 2020. Uh, that may have been my fault because I wanted him to stay home, okay? I don't know for sure. But he was released from 10 and a half years of incarceration, and he came home to shelter in place. You're not going anywhere. So his long list of places he wanted to go and things he wanted to do had to wait, and we have watched the Lord work in his life in unusual ways. And I appreciate many of you have prayed him through those years. I'm looking at some faces, and we've been together for a long time. And I just appreciate that. Jared is now married to a sweet girl. Her name is Kana Rose. And they have a little boy now. His name is Gunner. Gunner, Gunner means bold warrior. And he was born a little early. And he's had some issues and some difficulties with things. And, and the Lord has been working in that little boy's life to overcome those. And we are extremely grateful for the faithfulness of the Lord. If you know me, you know my favorite word, my favorite scripture, and word is uh, Hosea 2.15. It says that the Lord will turn the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. And I was in the valley of trouble for, a, I felt like, a lot of years. And I think we've come out of that and now are walking in the, in the gateway of hope. So I'm not sure where you are in that journey. If it's a place of a valley of trouble or valley of uncertainty or valley of discouragement or disappointment. Girl, listen, you can hang on because the, the, valley of the, the uh, gateway of hope is on the way. It's a promise from the Lord. And I'm living proof that it happens in a life to those who refuse to give up. Uh, I received a t-shirt Friday. A friend of mine brought it to work. I've never seen this before. I wish I had thought of it. I have worn it uh, since Friday. She gave it, she gave it to me. And, and on the corner it says, I'm coming after everything God promised. I'm coming after everything God promised. And we need to be tenacious enough and spiritually strong, not in our own strength. Ephesians 1, 6 says, I will be strong in the Lord's might and in the power of his might. And what that means, darling, is he makes you brave. He enables you to do things that you feel like you cannot do. You cannot walk through. You cannot work through. But with the power of God at work in your life, you can. And not only that, you can help others do the same. So tonight we're going to be in an unusual scripture. We're going to be in Haggai. And everybody said, oh, yay, that will be fun. <laughs> The book of Haggai, where did you get this from? So uh, it may or may not even be in your Bible. Sometimes I find it, sometimes I can't. So if you have your Bible, here's what we're going to do. Everybody turn to Matthew. We know where that is. And if you don't have your Bible, don't worry. I I'm just going to read a story to you. And I'm going to walk through some of these scriptures. And we're going to find out 
why at times the Lord withholds his blessing from us. We're going to find out a problem that these people had that I feel like are often a problem in our life and the solution. There are going to be about three action steps. So you're going to go to Matthew and go, go to the left about two or three, go three blocks, I think to the left. And you will find this obscure book called Haggai and it's only two chapters. So while you're turning there, I'll tell you a funny thing that happened with my husband during this heart transplant. Uh, they did the surgery uh, all through the night. And so they came back, brought him back from IC, into ICU at about five o'clock the next morning. And so he came in, of course, he was hooked up to all of these machines, all of these tubes going to the walls and four or five nurses in there and the doctor, and they were hooking him to all of these things. And, and I said, can I talk to him? Is it, can, they said, well, you can talk to him, but I, you know, he's completely out. He's not going to hear you. And so I, I walked up to him and I, I got right along his face and said in his ear, I said, baby, you did great. You have a new heart. You did great. And just hang on, hang on. And And um, about that time, I realized, even though I was right there by his face, I have never heard this heartbeat before. So I leaned my head down to his chest. I was right there. And sure enough, I heard that heartbeat, the heart of a stranger. Now, I don't want to be too graphic, but here's what actually happened. They cut my husband's chest open and cut his heart out. They put it in a bag. They took a heart from a cooler, put it in his chest, and it began to beat. Listen, darling, you got to believe in a God that gives the skill to a man to be able to make something like that happen. And so I I leaned over and I heard that heartbeat for the first time. And then I got all weird because I'd been up all night and I wasn't thinking clearly. And and I'm like, "Um, you know, I don't know about this new heart. Does it need to fall in love with me again? Do I have to win this heart over? You know, I'm like, do we have to ask Jesus into this heart? I don't know for sure. Uh, And then I'm like, while I'm down there, I'm like, hey, um, I'm running the show here and don't give me no trouble. Okay, well, you know, while my husband's out, I just thought I'd throw that in. I'm running the show, just need to let you know. I'm the love of your life and this is how we're gonna do things. Okay, so just to get that straight with him. And and so he has come through that. We have a little nerve damage that we still are, are dealing with, but But we are so thankful for what the Lord has done in his life. And it's interesting that a situation like that completely changes your perspective on life and what's important in your priorities. And we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight, what God's word has to say about that. Uh, It's a strong word of encouragement for you. Uh, Sometimes we can uh, get mixed messages. Sometimes you might feel like, I don't know what God's word is trying to say here. I'm I'm not getting the message. That happens all the time with me and Siri. Do y'all use Siri on your phone? I use her regularly because I travel a lot. And so I'll I'll tell Siri all the time, you know, text my husband. I call him hubby. Text hubby. Call Jared. Call Haley or do whatever. And call my mother-in-law. I mean, that's points in heaven. So I always start to do that. Um, and, and then I'll tell her to send a message of some kind. But she sends mixed messages. I don't know if it's my accent or, or what the problem is. I, I know for sure she's listening in because of some of the things that she sends. I asked her not long ago to send a message to a new staff member, to their wife. And I told Siri to send that. And I said, um, I look forward to meeting you in person. And then I'm driving, so I, you know, I didn't check it closely, but it sent the message, I look forward to seeing you in prison. Okay, I, no, no, I don't mean that. I, I'm not even kidding. Um, I, I, I asked Siri um, um, not long ago to uh, uh, send it to a friend of mine, and I was praying for her son, and it sent the message, I said, send, send so-and-so the message that I'm praying for that son of yours. Siri sent her the message, I'm praying for that sin of yours. I'm sure she's like, what? And my all-time favorite, I have a whole list. I mean, I, I, they're, they're so funny now. I've just, I've just started a list of all the things that she does not give my clear message on. And my all-time favorite, I sent one to my husband a while back about what God was doing in our life and in our family. And, and I said to him, I believe God is doing great things. I told Siri to send him that message. She sent him the message, I believe God is doing great thongs. And he got all excited about it. Uh, correction, correction. Not going to be a great thong going on here, okay? Just letting you know. So tonight, no problem with mixed messages, okay? 
God's word is very clear, it's very concise, and it's very action-oriented. The application is going to be very strong for you tonight. And I feel myself um, stalling, so we need to get right to it. This is going to be in Haggai. Let me give you the background. Let me give you the purpose. And think of this in light of your own life. I'm going to give you the purpose of Haggai and see if this might be going on in your life. And then let's see how this applies to our life. As we get ready to read God's word, would you please reach out and touch the sweet girl next to you? And let's ask the Lord to speak to us, please, in a very personal way tonight. This I know. He has come tonight with a personal word for you. And I think you're going to love it. Well, some of it you're not going to love. But most of it you're going to love. Okay, let's pray. Father, I'm overwhelmed by your presence in this place, and I know you have been uh, awaiting our arrival. You have filled this room with your presence, and I stand in awe. I humble myself before you, and I ask that, Lord, your intention for this night and for this message, you made all of these changes, and Lord, you gave me a strong word of encouragement for these people, and I pray that you would please help me to communicate it in a way that is personal. It's meaningful, it's beneficial, and it is a blessing to you. I pray tonight that you would get our understanding divided attention over all the things that are bothering us, are worrying us, are stressing us out, that in this moment, we just breathe in your spirit that's in this place. And Lord, we just let out that stuff. And we ask that you feel our minds, you redirect our thoughts that you correct our, our course if necessary. You challenge and you comfort and you encourage your people tonight through your word. We are your maid servants. Let it be as you desire. And all the girls said? Yes. All right, let me give you the background. Here's the purpose of why this little book is written in God's word. It's only two chapters. Here's the reason. God sent Haggai, God sent his messenger to the people with an important message. Some things were going on that he needed to change. There's an adjustment that needed to be made. I feel a little bit about, uh, I like that about tonight's message about me being here. So he called the people, and this is on a little handout that you have. I called the people to return and to rebuild. Uh, The Lord had given them an assignment to build the temple, and they started it, but they did not complete it. We're going to look at, because the Bible tells us exactly why they did not finish the task. He calls them out on the exact reason. So this little book in God's Word is calling us to return and rebuild and complete the assignment that the Lord has given them. And let's make that personal to us. If you are a Christian, if you're a Christ follower, there's a task, there's an assignment, you're part of the body of Christ, there's some things that the Lord wants you to do. And and the easiest thing in the world is to be distracted by that. By good things, by difficult things, sometimes it's hardship, sometimes it might be great things that get us off track. Because any step forward you make toward the Lord the enemy is going to oppose that. Any desire that you have to serve him, any plan that you have to tell others about him, any way that you allow him to work in your life, the enemy is going to try to shut that down as fast as he can. He does not want you to be used by the Lord. So Haggai is calling the people back to that. He redirects their priorities and he explains why at times... The Lord will withhold his blessing from our lives. These two chapters, we're just going to read part of one, is filled with action, a challenge, and a promise. And it's extremely applicable to our lives today. So let's let me give you the little background because there there's there's the little steps that built this up. And it's the reason Haggai came on the scene. So see if any of these things might be happening in your life today. So the background is that the temple in Jerusalem had been destroyed. The temple represented God's presence. So that was back in the day of Babylon captivity and all that. We won't get into that. But God's house had been destroyed. It was um, in ruins. Destruction had happened. So the Lord gave his people an assignment. Rebuild the house of the Lord. And they said, yes, sir. And they began to rebuild. Very soon thereafter, opposition came, and then priorities shifted, and then interest waned, and passion vanished, and people complained, and apathy set in, and the work 
ended for 15 years. And then God's blessing was withheld. Let's read Haggai chapter 1. Or I'm going to read, if you don't have your Bibles, I'm just going to read this story too. I'm reading from New Living Translation. Put yourself in this story and see how it applies to your life. Verse 1, on August 29th of the second year of King Darius' reign, the Lord gave a message to the prophet Haggai, to Zerubbabel, to the governor of Judah, and to the high priest. And this is what the Lord Almighty says. The people are saying, everybody said the people said. The people, okay, so with, your enthusiasm is overwhelming to me. Um, <laughs> let's go back to the passage. The, the Lord is saying, the people are saying. So everybody said, the people said. The people said, and I think about that in my own life. I wonder what the Lord might be saying of me. I wonder what he might say in heaven. Uh, Debbie Stewart said, Debbie Stewart was saying, what, what were the people saying? So the Lord said, the people were saying, the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house, the temple. Although he had clearly said, this is your assignment. But the people said, no, it's not. No, no. Verse 3, so the Lord sent this message through the prophet Haggai. Why are you living in luxurious houses while my house lies in ruins? This is what the Lord Almighty says. Consider your ways. Another translation says, consider how things are going for you. You have planted much, but harvested little. You have food to eat, but not enough to fill you up. You have wine to drink, but not enough to satisfy your thirst. You have clothing to wear, but not enough to keep you warm. Your wages disappear as though you were putting them in pockets filled with holes. This is what the Lord Almighty says, consider your ways or consider how things are going for you. Now, everybody say now. Now, now go up into the hills, bring down the timber or, or another translation says, cut the wood and rebuild my house. Then... Everybody say then. then. Please make this connection between now and then. Now, when you do a certain thing, then it's going to put the Lord in action. Then it will be an honor. Then, it, then in it, I will be honored, says the Lord. So this tells us right now how you can bring honor to the Lord. You hoped for rich harvest, but they were poor. And when you bought your harvest home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house lies in ruins, says the Lord Almighty, while you are all busy building your own fine houses. That is why not many times in God's word that he says the reason he is doing a certain thing, he doesn't often give the reason. Right now he's very clear. It's why, because you did that. That is why the heavens have withheld the dew and earth has withheld its crops. I have called for a drought on your fields and hills, a drought to wither the grain and grapes and olives and all other crops, a drought to starve both you and your cattle, and get this last part, and to ruin everything you have worked so hard to get. Now here is a conflict that arises. Uh, they had a conflict of interest. The Lord gave them an assignment and they started it well, but they did not finish it well. The Bible gives the reasons why. They became very busy building their own houses. Their priorities were about their own things and their own stuff. And what they failed to connect in their mind, what they failed to realize and, and didn't connect is that their adversity was a result of their disobedience. We need to remember that sometimes adversity in our life could be in a direct connection to disobedience in our life. And so they failed to make that. So that was the problem. The problem was they had not completed. They stopped doing what the Lord had asked them to do because they lost passion for it. And they got busy, interested in other things and involved in other things. I'm not saying bad things. I'm not saying they were all going down to the, to the bar. I'm not saying they were all going, I come from a wackadoo family, so sometimes they, they hung out, hang out at the bar and they hang out at the casino and places like that. I'm not saying that's what they were doing. They may have been doing good things. Nonetheless, it took them away from the great thing God had chosen them, God had asked them to do. 
I want you to think about some things that the Lord has asked you to do. In our life, the Lord has asked us to parent a prodigal. It was a hard thing for us to do. I, I went into that assignment kicking and screaming, if you will. I was disobedient at, at some time during that journey. So he gave them the solution. He gave them, he let them know the problem. Consider your ways, which basically means look at what's going on around you and figure this out. Like, are you seeing that you're bringing this harvest, uh, but it's not, it's not feeling your, your stomachs? Are you seeing that you have all this clothes, but you're not warm? Do you realize that you're putting money in your pocket, but it's like it has holes in it? And so he, he's drawing their attention. Look, consider what's going on with you and make this connection. And then he gives them the solution. So the Lord said, first thing was to consider your ways. What, what is God asking you to consider tonight? Just look around at how things are playing out. What's happening here? So God sent Haggai to give them the message and encourage them about God's faithfulness and to say, this assignment is still in play. You need to get back to the work you were called to do. You need to get back to your first love. You need to reprioritize, maybe rearrange some of the things that got out of whack. And so let's get back to keeping the main thing the main thing. They had gotten sidetracked. They'd gotten distracted. They were discouraged. The enemy made sure that they stayed discouraged. And they cared more about their own homes and what they wanted to do when they wanted to do it. And the Bible says that, that they were building their own homes, luxurious homes, or your translation might say paneled houses. One theologian said that, that the paneled houses was actually people using the wood that they had, had brought in to build the Lord's temple. Since the work stopped and nobody was doing the work, they thought, well, that would be... That would be useless just to let that wood sit there. So they borrowed it to build their own houses. That's why the Lord is calling them out so strongly about that. They took what belonged to the Lord. They took what was His and started building their own thing, what they wanted. So Haggai lets them know, we have got to go for a course correction here. Or God's going to continue to withhold His blessing. And they walked around the destruction. They walked around those ruins, half built, not even half built, it wasn't even that far, a little bit built. They walked around it for 15 years. Now listen, here's what bothered, here's what bothered me about that. The Lord brought that to my attention and I have not stopped thinking about it. For 15 years, they walked. So that's probably a whole nother generation by that time they've had children and they're teenagers by this point. They have walked in and out they have walked among these ruins. They have walked around these places that the Lord intended to be built up by this one. They just walked in and out of the ruins. I guess they did what culture tells us to do. Hey, it is what it is. Hey, live, hey, live with your new normal. That's, that's just the way it is. And they didn't do anything about it for 15 years. I got to thinking about my own life. How many times have I just learned to live with what had happened? For a lot of times in my life, a lot of years, I'm kind of a rule follower. And, and in my life, I have lived by the consequences of someone else's choices. And I used that, I didn't realize it till recently, as a big excuse in my life. I li uh, I'm living today with some consequences that my dad set in motion when I was a child. I, to this day, I live with consequences of that. Our son made some consequences, made some choices that had severe consequences. I had to live with the consequences of those choices of rebellion and addiction. And other people have made, have made choices that affected me. And so I kind of carry that around as like some excuse. And for 15 years they did that. I want you to think about what you have just allowed to be in play for 15 years thinking there's nothing I can do about it. It's just the way it is. It's just new normal, whatever. And when I began to work through this with the Lord, He let me know on no uncertain terms. I didn't ask if you broke this. I didn't ask if you're the one that made a mess of it. I didn't ask if you're the one that destroyed it. I'm not asking if you're the one that threw the bomb in it. I didn't ask if you messed it up. I asked if you'd fix it. I, what I'm asking here is if you would rebuild it. Not who tore it down. Let's talk about who rebuilt it, and that's you. 
I'm calling you to be a part of the rebuild, ir irregardless of who tore it down. I've picked you to build it up. And that's a choice we all make. I feel like that kind of happened, this whole process happened with us in COVID. Maybe we didn't mean to, certainly didn't plan to, but we got pushed back from God's work. We got derailed. Uh, many of us got distracted because we stayed in a, a certain structure, maybe. I talked to a friend this last week, and she had signed up for Bible study, and it was, we'd been three weeks in, and she hasn't shown up yet, so I called her. I said, hey, I saw you registered for Bible study, but I haven't seen you. Is everything okay? Just called to check in with her. And she said, girl, I'm not coming to Bible study. It's so hot outside. I said, you got about 30 seconds to change your attitude before I come to your house and yank your pajama pants off of you to get dressed to come to Bible. I said, and you know what? You know what's going to happen in December? It's going to be too cold. You know what's going to happen in March? It's too rainy. The enemy will always be sure you have a good excuse for why you're not doing what the Lord has asked you to do. Because a part of this building the temple has to do with us. Because God resides in us. This is also the temple of God. And he's asking us to rebuild some broken down places and some busted up places to rebuild and get back to knowing him again. Get back to sharing him and um, loving other people. Knowing God and loving other people is part of our assignment. But COVID, boy, it had a way of pulling us away, pushing us down, forcing us out. And it's been hard, according to some statistics, recent statistics, about 30% of the church has never returned. I'm not talking about people that lost their life to COVID. I'm talking about you were a faithful member and here on a regular basis, and now you're not. About 30%. I guess the enemy thinks that's pretty funny. The breakdown of the family leading to the breakdown of the church. They started the work with the right attitudes, and they slipped back or were pushed back or forced out, whatever you want to call it. I believe it was a tactic of the enemy. And then the work stopped. So the people begin to be frustrated, and then they, the opposition began to oppose their progress. And this led to a period of great discouragement. And the walls were not being repaired, and the passion evaporated. Apathy set in, and they got busy doing their own homes and, and completing their own plans and doing what they wanted to do when they wanted to do it. And that's when a famine hit. And God said, I'm not going to bless your crop. And I'm not going to bless the work of your hand. It's all going to be in ruins if you do not reprioritize and reorganize what I've asked you to do. And to come back. I hope that this is a year that it's the comeback year for us. But they were so discouraged, they, they declared there's just no way that we can do this. And they became indifferent and they did not move forward. Matthew 6.33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. We were at our uh, grandkids' house not long ago. We have five now, and so Clark is eight. He's our oldest, and Luke is five, and I was at the kitchen table. I was at Haley's house at the kitchen table. Um, um, I mean, excuse me, Luke was at the kitchen table. He was drawing, and I was on the couch with Clark. I was reading a book to him and Samantha. And so I was reading, and, and I noticed, boy, Clark was into this picture he was drawing. And, I mean, he I had a big, huge poster board. He was using all kind of colors. And he was, I mean, he was just getting with it. And so finally he said, Dodie, my picture is finished. That's my grandmother named Dodie. Dodie, my picture is finished. And he held it up with great pride. He held up that picture. Of course, I'm on the couch, so I'm across the room from him. I said, buddy, that looks great. That's a great picture. He slapped it down, and he said, Dodie, you can't see it all from there. Come over here. So I got up from the couch and came to right next to him, and then I saw all the details and how his pictures told this story, a bizarre story of a man who was stuck on the side of a cliff. And the emergency helicopter was there and the emergency boat was there. I didn't see any of that from across the room. All I saw was a mountain across the room. That is a great picture. And then I realized there's a whole story here that I didn't know because I was too far away. Tonight, I think the Lord is saying, you can't see it all from there. Like, I need you to come here. I need you to come closer. I need you to draw 
near. I need you to lean in. I need to show you some things that you can't see from there. But you're so pissy doing your other stuff. You're busy over there. Okay, stop and come over here. Listen, the Lord has some things to show us. The Lord has some things to give us. But they're found usually on the mountain. We're going to see that in the solution. Uh, they're usually not found low. He usually wants you to come up higher to get those. You're not going to just willy-nilly buy those. You're going to have to make a plan. I got to go up higher. I think the Lord has something for me. I need to be in God's Word a little more. I need to ramp up my time. You know, we, we talk about 20 minutes a day for the rest of your life, that you ramp that up. The Lord has something for you, but it's a little higher than what you can see right now. So let's get up there and, and get it. So let's look at the solution, and you're going to see that's exactly what God's Word says. He says, uh, this is what the Lord Almighty says, consider your ways. So that was the first part of the solution. They had a problem, which they had a conflict of interest. I'm more interested in my stuff and what I'm doing than the Lord's stuff and what he was doing. That was the problem. The solution was the Lord saying, hey, hey, darling, um, time out here. Um, look around. Um, pay attention. Consider your ways. That's the first part of the solution. It has a second part. It's found in verse 8. Consider your ways is verse 7. Verse 8, now climb the hill, get the wood, and rebuild the Lord's house. Climb the hill, get the wood, and rebuild the Lord's house. And I need you to know the enemy opposes those things. And when we are attentive to the Lord, when we draw near to the Lord, that is when clear vision comes. That is when divine energy, that we would have the energy to climb the hill and get the wood. That's when renewed passion. Now we're back in line. We have realigned our lives. That's when fresh ideas, creative solutions. That is when God gives you everything you need to complete this assignment. That it has purpose. It has meaning. And life has purpose. And it's successful. Again, and maybe you've been wondering, oh, what is the, what's the purpose of all of this? Like, I'm just, I'm over it. I'm like, I'm tired of it. And so the word is that we realign and we return to the work of the Lord. And I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, and let me finish reading that scripture because it tells what happens. Uh, climb the hill, get the wood, and rebuild the Lord's house. Then, when you do that, so he's given clear action. Climb the hill and get the wood and rebuild the Lord's house. Then I will take pleasure and I will be honored, says the Lord Almighty. And I know what some of you are thinking. I thought this very thing. Well, Debbie, sir, you, you have no idea what I've been through lately in my life. Okay, climb the hill and get the wood. Debbie, you have no idea the pain that I've been going. Get the Kleenex, climb the hill and get the wood. Okay, but Debbie, lately in my church and in my family, every day, climb the hill and get the wood. Anybody, like stop whining, climb the hill, get the wood. So if we, have to, if we have to make adjustments in our life, God says, this is what's gonna honor me. This is your assignment. It doesn't say cross the street and get the wood. I wish it did. It doesn't say go down into the valley and get the wood. Why does it have to be climb the hill? Anybody, climb the hill and get the wood. Here's why. Because God's assignments are not always easy. But he says, if you will do this, if you'll climb the hill and get the wood, if you'll rebuild my house, I'm going to be honored. And I'm going to bring blessing back into your life. And I'm going to open up the windows of heaven. But listen, we've got to climb the hill and get the wood and get back to being uh, busy. And with the, not busy, busy, but, but making that our priority in life. We've got to return back to the work of the Lord. God wanted his people involved in his work. If I were him, I wouldn't do that. Like, I totally wouldn't do that. I've told him so many times, listen, I just, I'm trying not to embarrass you tonight. Lord, please, like, just do something in my life. Why do you not make a mess of things? Like, I would just program. If I were him, I would totally program people to do the right thing. But he doesn't do that. He gives us choices. You can climb the hill and get the wood or not. You can stay in your house and watch Netflix. You're welcome. Or you, or you, or you could do what the Lord does. There's a scripture at the latter part, so let's go back and I'm going to read the rest of the story because something happened that I did not realize 
the Lord does. And I love the terminology that's in the New Living Translation. So we left off on him, him saying, I'm going to withhold my blessing and I'm going to ruin everything that you have worked so hard to get because it's, you've got to get back to prioritizing. And so the Bible says that Haggai, this, let's go back to um, verse 12. Then Zerubbabel and the high priest and the governor um, gave this message from the Lord and the people obeyed the message from the Lord, their God. It had been delivered by the prophet Haggai, whom the Lord, their God had sent and the people worshiped the Lord in earnest. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave the people this message from the Lord. I am with you, says the Lord. I love that. I am with you, says the Lord. Verse 14, my favorite. So the Lord sparked the enthusiasm of Zerubbabel and of the governor of Judah and Jeshua, the son of Je Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of God's people. The Lord sparked their enthusiasm. If you've been watching the news lately, you can see what a little spark will do. It'll create a wildfire. A little spark. The same is true when God sparks your enthusiasm. Like I didn't realize He would do that. To be quite transparent over the last several months at the pace of life, just some family things going on, some church things going on, some life things that are happening, just the fast pace of this year, and some things that have changed have, have left me somewhat d disillusioned. And sometimes you can be blindsided by things. You didn't realize just unexpected things, not necessarily all bad things, but things that needed to happen. We've been going through a time of transition in our church, not bad things. Our pastor of 30 years retired. Our worship pastor of 30 years retired. That is great that a pastor would be at a church for 30 years. That is a great thing. But those are two huge areas. We, um, we're looking for like four staff members. Our, our minister of children retired. And so we've just had a lot of things happen. They've been teamed together for a long time. So I felt just, uh, just transition for too much, too long, too fast. Maybe you felt like that from life. It's just, it's just too much, too long. After COVID, it's just, it's just too much for too long. And I've experienced some of those things. Things happen in our family and, again, necessary things. And people get discouraged and changes happen. Like, do y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, plans blow up and plans change and schedules aren't what you thought and reports aren't what you thought and doctor's visit lead to something that you didn't expect and just hadn't felt right and you know you watch tv and the gas prices are skyrocketing and stock market is tanking and i don't know it's 150 degrees outside i don't know stuff happens you know anybody like this stuff is happening and the war and the the the, the too much not long ago, I pulled up to my desk where I meet with the Lord on a regular basis. And that's this place I fell in love with the Lord. Just pulled up there. Usually I'm very excited about meeting with the Lord. I'm a morning person. I like getting up to see what the Lord has to say. I feel like oftentimes He leads He leaves me on a cliffhanger the day before, like there's something coming. I, I can't wait to get back in the morning and figure out the next step or what the next thing is going to be. But I did not feel that way that morning. And I pulled up to the desk, and all that I could get out in that moment was, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I wish I was here with more excitement. I, I wish I was here filled with enthusiasm, with momentum, and with energy. But the truth is, I'm barely here. I have pulled myself up to this desk today in tears. Now, I'd been studying in Haggai, and I knew chapter 1. I knew all the excuses that they had given. But if you can imagine, I told the Lord that my excuses were legit. Anybody? Really? Really going to tell the Lord, your reasons are legit. I have legit reasons for acting the way that I'm acting. Just need to fill you in, Lord. I got my, my reasons are legit. Uh, and I don't know why lightning has not struck me by this point. But that is, in all honesty, what I said to the Lord. And then I came to the second part of chapter 1 that says, Oh, but he will spark your enthusiasm. He will spark your enthusiasm. 
And as I sat there in that moment, as the Lord was beginning to do that, and me telling him all my reasons were legit, this is what I heard in my spirit from the Lord that morning. There is never a good reason to not rebuild my house. There's just never a good reason not to do that. Miss Stewart, you might think your reasons are legit. Everybody's got their own list. There's never a good reason. And very much like the people in those times, I had let things of the world, things of life, my stuff, my issues, crowd out the things of God so much to the point that it sucked the very enthusiasm, the energy out. And that morning, the Lord said, oh, but you don't realize, I will spark your enthusiasm. That's part of the reason I'm here today with this message. For some of you tonight, the Lord has said, darling, I'm here to spark your enthusiasm. I know it has long since been gone. I know that it has, you've been sucked dry with the caregiving and with all kinds of crazy things in your life, just like they were. But the answer is, climb the hill and get the wood. And if you're tired, take a nap and climb the hill and get the wood and rebuild the Lord's house. And if you're exhausted or whatever the reason might be, climb the hill and get the wood. But we let those things crowd out. Very much, let me illustrate it this way. Very much how um, the Lord works in our life through issues and things that we have going on in our life. And the Holy Spirit in Philippians, I've given you this scripture in 2.13 on your handout. The Bible says that the, that the Lord, that the Holy Spirit that lives in us gives us the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. I sat there that morning at my desk explaining to the Lord why I had no desire and why I had no power. But he was like, okay, the only problem with that is, Miss Stewart, it's Philippians 2.13. So get the scissors and cut that out of your Bible if you're not going to believe it. Because I give you the power and I will spark your enthusiasm, whether you're ready to be sparked or not. You just lit your fire right here. And so what happens is when the Holy Spirit is at work in our life, it, it kind of happens like this. Just like the people in that day, just like for today, things happen. Uh, I'm going to let these ping pong balls represent things that happen in our life that get us distracted and sidetracked. This one says pain, uh, sometimes emotional pain, sometimes physical pain, sometimes other kind of pain. This is uncertainty. If you've watched the news any length of time, I feel like there's a lot of uncertainty. Personal preferences, I like my life to be a certain way and I'm not happy when it doesn't go that way. Variety, uh, just various levels of anxiety can take over broken relationships, worry, concern about kids and grandkids, generally not happy, like numb to circumstances in life, fear, bad habits, anger, hardship, loneliness, stress, we were watching the news the other day, watching all these things are happening and watching our 401 tank, you know, and, and we watch all these things and we turn the news off and my husband looked at me, my two disciples, he's like, I feel like we should call somebody. I'm like, I know, who do we want to call? I don't know. And then the Lord reminded me, call on the name of the Lord. That's who you call out to because we are in some difficult days and 2 Timothy tells us, hey, this is where we're going to be headed. You got to be ready. Stresses of life, hardship, depression, attitudes, unbelief, all of those things, this represents our life, all of those things come in and crowd that out. And when Philippians 2.13 says, but the power of the Holy Spirit comes in you and comes on you, this water represents the Holy Spirit. And as, it, as you begin to fill your life with 20 minutes a day, as you begin to, to climb the hill and get the wood, all of these things begin to come out. And, and, and then do you see what happens about right here? If you can see, it's about three-fourths of the way. They're clinging to one another. Now they're hanging on. And, and in all honesty, it feels like, I, feels like, I, feel, I feel like that this represents my life. Like, I got a lot of Jesus in me. <laughs> are, you with, are you with me? Like, I got a lot of Jesus in me. But I got some things right here at the top, like right at the, that hanging on, that don't seem to let go. But as I continue to spend my time with the Lord, as I continue to climb the hill and get the wood and rebuild the Lord's house, all of those things 
are no longer filling my life. Now, please notice, they're still in my environment. You know, we don't get the luxury of just throwing them out all over the place and they no longer exist. Oh, they're still here. We have to learn to build our life around those things. Filled up with the Holy Spirit so that we can deal with what's around us. Not in us, not taking over, not crowding out. Let the Lord crowd those things out and be filled with the Lord. And there's only one way to do that, and that's in His Word. And these people, along with myself, had gotten off track, and I began to be filled with other things until the Lord said, here's how to get rid of that. Here's how to get back in perspective. Here's how to get back lined out as you climb the hill and get the wood. And no more excuses. So that work is lined out for us. And what I have asked tonight is that he would spark your enthusiasm. And that spark would spread among your family. It would spread among your church. It would spread in your community, just like the wildfires that are going on all over East Texas, but especially in California. We hear all of that. And it was started by either a little, um, uh, uh, little spark from a welding. One of those was started. Someone was welding something and a little spark flew onto the grass and it spread. Can you imagine what would take place in the house of God if things like this begin to spread like wildfire? And we, we realigned our priorities. We returned to the work of the Lord. We rearranged our schedules. And we climbed the hill and get the wood and rebuild the Lord's house. This house, you, and this house, the temple of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight that has... I believe, sparked our enthusiasm. And Lord, I, I know what it feels like to just come sometimes exhausted and just no clear thoughts and a little bit in a fog. And Lord, I'm so grateful for your word that says, here's the next step that you should take. And Lord, I pray that together we will do that. You didn't call just the staff to climb the hill. You didn't call just certain people, but everybody working together, carrying the wood together so that we can be a light in a dark place so that people will find a place to come and find hope so that our conversations are honoring to you that our attitude is pleasing to you and that we're able to point others to you where they can find hope even in the midst of that valley of trouble so, Lord, I pray for just for personal application as we leave tonight that you'll help us to continue to apply this to our own life and that you'll work this through uh, our minds and our emotions as well. In your name I pray. And all the girls said? Amen. Amen. Rule follower. Everybody in this room, I have emailed and sent that little card saying what you're going to speak on. I prayed, and we chose songs. <laughs> you have to come back, but those songs went better with this message. I don't know that you're a rule follower, but you are a God follower. We loved having you here. Is Quentin still here? I think he's in the back, so yeah. <laughs> just, just me. I don't care what you you speak about. Um, I have a song for you, but I got I got to get my guy. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes you don't need words. You can hear the words when you hear the music. Yeah. Laura Bush made these little cards for me. I, I went to restaurants and put those things out. <laughs> that was so wonderful, and that is exactly. I know. I don't think they even rehearsed this. 
Nope. <laughs> not, not a note. <laughs> and, and Quentin says, what are we going to do? You, you wait. Save the date if you loved coming tonight, and maybe you'd like to come back and hear. I've never talked, I've never given my testimony uh, at this church, and so I'm going to do that on the 15th. And we're going to, we were going to have cookies in our new fellowship hall, and it's not done, so you have to mingle right here tonight. But we do have cookies for you <laughs> on every door, every every place you would leave, uh, homemade cookies. And the women of this church can cook. Um, but anyway, if you'd like to come back and hear some testimonies, there's little cards are all around, and I have all of your emails, and I think that I've already sent this to most of you. And then on August 22nd, June Hunt is going to share her testimony. I'm, I've never heard it in entirety. I'm looking forward to that. And then on August 29th, Marianne Leach. I spelled her name wrong. She let me know because we have that relationship. <laughs> We'll share hers, but we will have a light dinner, so you have to let us know you're coming. This is outreach. I know that you all have your churches and that you're all churched, most of you, and, uh, and blessed there. Um, but if you know of someone who might want the intimacy and a fabulous pastor such as we have at this church and a band like this, you send them our way. And we will love on them. We have people in the nursery waiting to take care of children and youth, and we are a loving church. So thank you for coming, you're amazing. I'm gonna book Debbie tomorrow, and bet you got books. If you go out, there's a little room we call the parlor out there if you'd like to say hi to her or to get a book. And I hope you have change, because I didn't bring any. But then you're a rule follower, so I guess so. <laughs> Father, we thank you for this evening, we thank you for the cookies, we thank you for the fellowship. We thank you that we can, <laughs> girls, as you know, Father, we can just stand around and talk in any, any room. So that won't be a problem. But we lift this evening up to you, Father, that it doesn't end here, that we do go get the wood, that we do remember to uh, go back and, and uh, review this scripture, hide it in our hearts, and to love you in a better way because we as women gather together to be together in your name. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. <laughs>